Thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I'm Chrissy Giuliano, Executive Director of the Big Cities Health Coalition. Um, we're having a few technical difficulties with the cameras, so um, you'll be able to see one of us at a time, uh, which shouldn't be an issue because you'll be seeing the lovely data platform that we're going to walk you through today. Um, so for those of you trying to move the slide, oh, you're sharing. Can you, um, are you? Can you move the slide forward? Okay. So for those of you who um, don't know us, the Big Cities Health Coalition is a forum for leaders of America's largest metropolitan health departments to exchange strategies and jointly address issues to promote and protect the health and safety of the more than 61 million people they serve. Together, these public health departments, which you see on the slide here, directly affect the health and well being of about one in five Americans or 20% of the population. Again, here you see our 35 member jurisdictions. Uh, the six that are in red are our new additions in just the past year. And you'll hear more about that when we talk about data. The Big Cities Health Inventory was created about 15 years ago by a group of big city epidemiologists. They publish chart books on a somewhat regular basis to share information with their peers in other jurisdictions to benchmark health indicators across cities. In 2015, BCHC relaunched the health inventory as an online platform with funding from the centers of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC. In 2019, BCHC partnered with the Urban Health Collaborative at Drexel University's Dorn Snipes School of Public Health. The Urban Health Collaborative was created to leverage the power of data, research, education, and partnerships in order to make cities healthier, more equitable, and environmentally sustainable. We cannot thank Drexel enough for their work on the platform over the last few years. Shortly, we'll discuss some key features of the platform, which you can also find at bigcitieshealthdata.org. We'll go ahead and drop that link in the chat, so feel free to open it up and follow it along. Um, I would also be remiss if we didn't recognize the funding partners who support the Big Cities Health Inventory. So the platform is primarily supported by the CDC through a cooperative agreement with the National Association of County and City Health Officials, or NACHO. RBCHC staff time is supported by a number of health philanthropies from whom we have ongoing grants. All that said, the views expressed here do not necessarily reflect the views of the CDC or the B or BCHC's foundation funders. So we'll talk more about all of this over the course of the next hour, but just to set the stage, data are needed at the local level, and in our case, not just the county level, but the city level. Viewing trends at the local municipal level helps inform policy decisions and can identify those that are working or those that may not be. So let's jump in. Um, if questions arise throughout the conversation, please put them in to the Q&A and we'll answer them later in the webinar. Um, so I, at this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Amy Auchincloss from the Drexel Urban Health Collaborative. She'll uh, pass the baton to the rest of the team as we move uh, through the presentation. So Amy, you should be able to turn your video on now and I'm gonna go on mute. Great. Hi. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. We're thrilled to have you here. Um, I'm Amy Auchincloss, a co-principal investigator at Drexel Urban Health Collaborative, co-principal investigator on the Big Cities Health Data Platform. Also a co-principal investigator on Adia's Ru. She wasn't able to join us today. And Simon Niamatula, who you'll be hearing from in a minute, who's a lead data manager. Jennifer Coker, who you'll be hearing from today as well, um, associate dean here at the school, and Carrie Moore, who's not here with us today. Um, so Drexel Urban Health Collaborative is located at, um, in Philadelphia at the Drexel School of Public Health. The UHC leads and supports a number of projects that focus, focus on urban health in cities across the nation as well as across the globe. So uh, most of the data, our data team is focused on work that uses data to document health inequalities and also inform ways to reduce those health inequalities. So please reach out to us if you have more questions. Wanted to just um, reiterate what Chrissy was talking about. We have 35 member cities that are currently in the platform. 
It is an open access um, data platform. Six cities recently joined us, um, so joined the um, BCHC, and so we're added into the platform, and those are in red here. The platform has over 100 metrics that cover these 11 categories on the right. There's over 100,000 data points, and we're continuing to add some more data. So how were the metrics chosen? They were chosen primarily because of their public health relevance. Um, so they align with CDC's Healthy People goals and or our benchmarks for new policy initiatives. Um, and they highlight demographic and socioeconomic disparities in health, as well as healthy environments. Many of the metrics that you see on the platform were part of BCHC's prior version of the platform. Want to highlight for those of you that are already familiar with the platform, you'll see some new metrics that we added this year, COVID-19 deaths, drug overdose deaths, racial segregation across cities, the flu vaccination data from Medicare, and the percent unhoused or homeless populations in the cities. Some highlights that distinguish our platform from some other platforms you might be familiar with. So we only are showing BCHC member areas. That's currently 35 cities. The majority of data are city level versus county level in many other platforms. The data are uniform and standardized across cities to allow for comparability. Data primarily come from US government sources and much of the data in the platform spans 2010 to 2020, and we are continuing to update data as they become available, um, and we'll be updating data for 2021 uh, as the year closes out. So data, um, other highlights of our platform are the data visualization. Users can look at data for a single year or data in trends over time. Users can download charts as well as send uh, pre-populated charts or links to via social media. And users can also directly download the data and Simo will be walking us through some of those features. We wanted to bring your attention to some data briefs that are in the What's New page on the platform and that uh, we can share in the chat um, while we're during our webinar. So the first is a obese, looking at obesity and risk factors in city environment across the big cities. The second we, that we issued this year recently, it was focused on drug overdose deaths in the big cities, and then finally um, gun deaths in the big cities. So um, epidemics of, uh, that have, have had a huge impact on um, life and um, mortality in cities. Let's um, move over to the demonstration so um, you can get a sense of the platform. Saima, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Amy. Hi, okay. Thank you, Amy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, let me start sharing my screen, I hope. All right, okay. So this is the this is the homepage. Um, the link to the website should be in the chat. The four main ways that we can view the data in the platform are explore a big city, compare cities, Simon, view a metric. I think, think you can start your video. Um, you can try. I, um, I'm sorry. No, I can't. Um, it's not working. It's not working. Okay, sorry. Okay, so, uh, oh, I've forgot the introduction. So I am Simon Yamutullah. I'm the data analyst for the Big Cities Health Inventory Data Platform. And I'm responsible for the data management for the website. So I'll just walk, quickly walk through the main functionalities uh, that are available for the platform. Uh, the four main ways that you can view the data are explore a big city, compare cities, view a metric, and the inequities. So first for the explore a big city, we choose us. I'll choose El Paso. In this page, you can view multiple metrics for a single city 
over the top, we have a city blurb which gives some basic demographic information about the city. The page pre-populates with some default metrics that for all available years. So we have uh, COVID-19 death rates for only 2020. And in the second chart, you can see the trend in diabetes death on the x-axis are the years. We have the data for 2010 to 2020 for most of the metrics in our platform. In order to change the metric, you can use the pop-out window where all the metrics are listed in a categorized list. So we have over 100 metrics. And so if you go, and go under the mental health and substance abuse category, you can see the, all the metrics under that category. You can also choose metrics from, you can also choose the metrics from the drop-down menu, which has the lists, all the metrics. The bar is also searchable. So if you were, for example, if you want the data on overdose deaths, you can type in overdose and we have metrics, opioid overdose death and drug overdose deaths in our platform. I choose drug overdose deaths. We can see, view the data by uh, population subgroups by using the group by. For most metrics, we have uh, the data for race or sex or race and sex strata. So I'll choose race strata. So here we can see the COVID-19 deaths by race for 2020. We can also view the uh, time turn data by race by strata. So here again, if I choose race, uh, you can view the time turns by race. We can add uh, more metrics by clicking on the add metric button. And uh, you can add as many metrics as you want to your analysis. There's no limit. So this was exploring a big city where we can view multiple metrics for a single city. If you want to compare say, your cities with other cities in the BCHC, you can use the compare cities. So in this page, we can compare metrics across other cities in the BCHC. For to compare cities, step one is city selection. I'll choose El Paso and choose cities for comparison. We can either choose all cities or a subset of cities. First, I will choose all cities. Step two is metric selection. I will choose drug overdose deaths again. So this is the chart for drug overdose deaths in 2020 for all BCHC cities. On the y-axis are the cities. We also have a vertical, vertical line for US total values for reference. By default, all the cities are in the alphabetic order. You can use the sort by to sort the data from high to low values. So the data are now sorted. To put your city into context, you can use the group cities by option, you can, where you can group cities based on certain city characteristics like region, poverty, population, density, and segregation. I'll choose poverty. So here we can see the data, the cities are sorted into less poor cities and the poorest cities. And generally, generally we can see that the poorest cities tend to have higher drug overdose death rates. In this page also, you can add multiple metrics by add, hitting the add metrics button. In the compare cities page, you can view data by race subgroups uh, and also for trend data for all years, but only if less than seven cities are selected. In the interest of time, I have already selected six cities and added the metrics. So in order to view the data by race strata, we can go into the group by and select race. So here we can compare the racial disparities in drug overdose deaths across the multiple cities. And uh, if, I, when, if I want to see the time trends, I can select all years. And here I can compare the time tre the trend in adult mental distress across six BCHC cities. So this was a uh, compare cities. Uh, the next is view a metric where we can view a single metric in details. In order to do that, we can we have to select a metric. I will select drug overdose again and El Paso. In the view a metrics page, 
we can see a single metric in the different ways that the data are available in the platform. In the first chart, we can see the drug overdose deaths for whole years. In the second, the drug overdose deaths in 2020. In the third chart, we have the drug overdose deaths for all years by race, by sex. And then here we have the drug overdose death by race for singly for 2020, then by sex, by race and sex, et cetera. So if you want to take a deep dive into a single issue for your city, this would be the page to visit. Uh, the fourth functionality, which is the inequities, is a new addition to the platform. In the inequities, we can view racial and ethnic inequities for some of the platform's metrics to understand the difference between the groups. Currently, we have mainly some mortality metrics uh, <clears throat> in this page, but we are planning to add more metrics in the recent future. So in order to view the metrics, we again, we have to first select the metric. For city selection, <clears throat> we can either select all cities or a single city. I will select all cities first. I leave the year to 2020. So this is the racial and ethnic inequities in drug overdose deaths. Different panels are for the different races. The first chart is the inequities for the black population. In the y-axis are the cities. The central axis in the inequities charts start at zero. The inequities can have both positive and negative values. Each bar represents the absolute difference in the rates for blacks minus white. So if, for example, for San Francisco, the bar is has a positive value, which implies that the drug overdose death rates for black population is higher compared to white population. And in Cleveland, the bar has a negative value implying that the drug overdose death rates for black persons is lower when compared to white persons. Similarly, in the next panel is for the Hispanic white difference. And we can see most of the bars are to the, uh, to the left or has negative value implying the Hispanic population over in these cities have uh, the Hispanic population has drug overdose rate, rates which are lower when compared to white population. And the last panel is for the Asian Pacific Islander and white difference. When you hover over the bar, there is a little small explanation of the values. For the inequities, we can also choose a single city and in which case all the inequities are displayed in the same chart. So the blue bar is for the black white difference, the green bar is for the Hispanic white difference. The bar for the Asian white difference is missing because the re, uh, drug overdose death rates for Asians is too low and does not meet the minimum threshold for display in our platform. Currently, we don't have the ability to see time trends for inequities, but we do have the data over multiple years and you can cycle through the years to get an idea of the change over time. So these are the four main functionalities available to the website. I would now like to talk about how we can you can download the data in the platform for use. All the charts can be downloaded by clicking on the hamburger at the corner of the charts. The charts can be downloaded in different formats like PNG, JPEG, or PDF, or SVG vector image. You can also share a pre-populated web page using the share. Most of for the data for most of the metrics can be downloaded as an Excel spreadsheet. The download, the link to the download page is down below. And if you need more information uh, about the metrics, uh, the about and the FAQs page has more information about the source and the metrics. The FAQ also has um, technical documentation, which gives more details about the metric definitions and methodologies. And finally, we have the What's New page where we where we can, you can find news about new metric release and other publications done using the data from the platform, like the briefs that Amy showed in her presentation. And finally, I, we hope you will subscribe for subscribe to the website to stay updated on the exciting new developments happening in the website. 
we always love to hear back from you. Please, if you have any questions or feedbacks, please feel free to email us at ehc at rexel.edu. And finally, there is a, a survey. We are con currently co conducting a survey to collect information to improve user experience and add meaningful features to the platform. The sur survey should pop up when you visit the platform, and we hope you will complete this short user survey. Uh, that's all from me. Uh, and back to you, Chrissy. Great, thanks so much. And I would just reiterate when folks visit the website, if you could fill out that survey, that would be super helpful to us. Um, it has some information about what you'd like to see um, and things like that. So really appreciate um, you sharing that with us or just reaching out to us as Simon said. So thanks everyone. Um, now I want to introduce um, Jen Kolker. And as I do that, if you have questions, um, you can also put them in the chat and we'll get to in the um, Q&A box rather, and we'll get to those um, in a few minutes. So Jen is Associate Dean for Public Health Practice and Clinical Professor of Health Management and Policy at the Dorn Smythe School of Public Health. Um, she leads the BCHC partnership with the work that we do together, as well as policy engagement activities at the Urban Health Collaborative. So hi, Jen. Thanks for joining us today. You're, you're muted. Um, I got my video working now. Right. I, I mean, here we all are, right? Like two and a half years into using Zoom and, and we still don't know what we're doing. Um, so, you know, Jen, you've worked at a big city health department. You do policy and practice research. Um, let's talk a little bit about how the dashboard can be used by public health professionals. How do you think some of the new additions, some of the inequities data or, or functionality, um, you know, will be important to those in the field? Sure. I, I mean, I think I think the most important thing to recognize is that you know every city is already kind of steeped in their own data. Um, so this isn't as much about telling cities what they already know, but giving cities and other people who are using the data, academics, other researchers the opportunity to look at things across different cities and to make some comparisons. And sometimes that can be a comparison of all 35 cities or maybe taking slices. What are their commonalities of cities of a similar size, a similar demographic, similar geography? And what are some differences? And I think that the new things we've just added on the inequities really help tease that stuff out as well. Because again, most cities that we're talking about, most of the cities in BCHC are already dealing with huge inequities. This is not new. There's nothing earth shattering, but this gives them a little bit of nuance to say, what are things that we expect to see because of the demographic, dem demographic makeup of our population? And what are things that are unexpected, even knowing the demographics of our population? And how does that compare? So I think the ability for cities to sort of look at their own data, but then also take a step back and kind of see where things are and benchmarking across other cities is, is just useful and important. So Jen, you and I could like spend an hour talking about these things, but why is it so important to have city level data versus county level or sort of other local um, jurisdictions? Because cities are different and cities are special. Um, I think as we know, you know, I, I'm in Philadelphia, so we actually have the benefit of our city is our county. So when we talk about county data, it's actually the city. Um, but if you're in a lot of other cities, uh, you're part of a bigger county and the county just doesn't tell the whole picture because we know that there are health indicators that are very different from cities. Similarly, if I look at the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, that's not telling the story for Philadelphia. So it's always important to look at different layers. What is happening at a county level is certainly important. What happens at a state level is important. What happens nationally is important. But the closer we can get to what's happening in a city, the better then that cities are able to target interventions and to create policies that are specific to the people living in that jurisdiction. Yeah, you know, and, and, you know, Jen and I, like I said, sort of spend a lot of time thinking and talking about this. And I think the other piece is, um, for me, is who is um, in this, in, in this example, a health department accountable to, right? So if the mayor is looking to see the impact of a policy he or she has proposed, proposed 
frankly, the mayor doesn't care about the rest of the county, right? The mayor wants to think about the city. So, you know, it's sort of a creature of how folks do their work and having the data to support that work. Yeah. Um, likewise, if you're sitting at the county level and you're making policy at a county level, you'd want to see that county data. So that's mm -hmm. sort of one of the, the other um, pieces that, you know, we think about. Um, so I think with that, we're going to do some Q&A and I think Elizabeth is gonna... Yes. Hello. Hello. So, um... Yeah, I'm going to be reading questions uh, for our folks to answer from the Q&A box. So if you have any additional questions that you'd like to add, just please feel free to add them as we're, as we're talking. So um, the first question I have here is uh, from Jennifer Stapleton, and she's wondering, uh, what is the most interesting takeaway that you found from looking through this data that you wouldn't have assumed if you hadn't explored of all this data? Amy, you want to take a, um, you want to start? There we go. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's actually quite a lot. Um, it's hard to, it's hard to even know where to start. Um, some of that then um, motivated doing the data briefs. So the first data brief was um, focused on obesity and city environment. And actually, I was quite surprised how well uh, some of the city environment or negative city environment was um, correlated with obesity, um, obesity in the populations across the city. So um, some of the patterns, so I guess the one way to answer that is there's some surprise maybe in the a single metric itself, but also in when we are, we're looking at a few metrics across each other, which you can do in the platform, you can keep adding metrics onto the page for most of the pages. You, you'll see that, that there's a fair amount of correlation over time or uh, within cities in the types of metrics. So for example, Saima was showing the drug overdoses, and then it is there is some fairly good alignment with adult mental health. I mean, we sort of would expect that, but at the same time, a, a lot of times data don't really line up the way we would expect, and we are um, we are able to to see that though in the platform. Um, yeah, there's there's um, I, I'm continually surprised with many of the indicators that we're loading up. Um, uh, it's, we'd love to hear actually what you, what you, some of the users are finding is, are surprising in, in their cities or whether it's things that they have already known already. You know, and I think not, not specific to the question, but just, you know, for some context, one of the reasons, and I, you know, I said this really quickly in the introduction, but one of the reasons the Big Cities Health Inventory started, you know, some 15, I guess almost 20 years ago now, um, was that city EPIs were getting asked questions by, you know, policy makers and leadership of the health department about their health metrics. And looking at that, frankly, compared to suburban counties, you know, state level data and things like that. And, you know, as Jen sort of touched on, they realized that they were seeing something different in the cities versus the counties or the other areas. But then when they started comparing themselves to cities, they realized that, huh, they weren't really that far off the mark, so to speak. And so, you know, one of the, I think there's a big picture takeaway in that there are, again, as Jen said, unique things about cities that affect particular health indicators. And, you know, part of what we at BCHC and, you know, the folks at the Urban Health Collaborative at Drexel try to do is identify those factors and then figure out, you know, what practice and policy changes we can work with cities on to try to, you know, in, in mitigate those factors or, you know, encourage other factors. Um, so it's really that idea of thinking about the environment in which, you um, things are happening and people are living, I think that is the one of the values of uh, the data platform. And, and I would jump in to say too, you know, 
when you work in a city or we work across cities, we, we get caught up on our own narratives, right? We know the data. Many of you here have been looking at this data in your cities for years. And it's always useful to have an opportunity to be surprised because sometimes it doesn't fit. Sometimes we think that the data is going to show us one thing and then we look and in fact, it's not the population that's always been most impacted that is, or a new infectious disease hits somebody differently than we think. So I think things like these data platform, being able to look at your own city, but also to be able to step back gives us a chance to say, huh, maybe some of my existing assumptions were not always on the mark. And that just makes us, that makes us better and, and stronger moving forward. I think what uh, thank you. just the, um, uh, the just even for the recent data that we loaded up, I was surprised for COVID. If you look at the Compare Cities page, the data page for COVID, El Paso really shoots up, um, and that I I didn't I maybe El Paso had was well aware of that that they were uh, really at the top of um, some of the COVID rates across big cities, but that wasn't uh, I I had not predicted that from um, just the, the uh, knowledge that I have of any. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question uh, from the Q&A is uh, from Louisa Brandau who asks, why when showing indicators by race, are there no values for American Indian slash Alaskan native? For our city for opioid deaths, for example, that is the most impacted group. Yeah, I can um, step in on that. That's a great question. And unfortunately, um, so the data are from the NVSS, the uh, vital records data for CDC. Um, there are a bunch of restrictions on cell sizes and whether they will release data for uh, at the city level. Um, and it has to do with, um, yeah, small, small ends and small ends over time. Um, so there's some censoring that's happening at the data source. Um, it's primarily primarily at the data source, and that it, that essentially informed what what race um, ethnic groups we are showing. So we are very limited. We we aren't showing, for example, multiple race. Uh, we aren't showing um, Alaska Native. We aren't showing. Um, for the most part, we aren't showing specific islanders separated out. They're grouped into um, uh, other Asian categories, and uh, we're not showing Alaska Natives either. So th um, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of restrictions, unfortunately, um, uh, in terms of the information that we're providing, and it's not a full picture. And certainly. For many local areas, um, some of these demographic groups that we're excluding or grouping into others is 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 problematic. So um, yeah, you this is probably an ongoing issue that you have um, highlighted in many of the data sources that you're looking at. Um, yeah, and you know, I think what what I would add, you know, again, at sort of the ten thousand foot level is. What you're able to show and able to get is a little bit of a trade off. So, in a previous iteration of the data platform, we got most of our data um, from individual cities. And so that meant in some cases, we would have slightly more detailed data around race and ethnicity in those areas, you know, where there was enough of a population to really expand that out. The, the most recent decision we made is to go generally with publicly available data sources, which means that our cities don't need to share, you know, 30 some odd data points for every year with us, um, you know, and it's standardized. Again, one of the key ideas behind the data platform 15 years ago was being able to compare apples to apples rather than apples to oranges. So definitely some trade-offs, but um, that's where we've landed um, recently and, you know, always interested in talking through sort of the pros and cons and if there, there are other ways to think about getting some of these data and, and things like that. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question um, I'm actually pulling from the chat and uh, Thomas Plant is asking, I think this is a question that sort of goes beyond the data set itself, but perhaps it's something we could discuss as, do we know if the drug overdose decrease was due to the use of Narcan? And I don't think that's specifically tracked in 
the data in this platform, but um, I wondered if anybody had any sense of whether that was a factor in that in that decrease. Sounds like no. <laughs> That's a great question. I was going uh, back to reread the question, but I, you know, I think we don't know is the the answer, and none of us want to hazard a guess. <laughs> I guess I would um I would just the generally the drug overdoses have increased though. Um, I'm not sure which um, which plot we were we were looking at that may have indicated a decline. Um, generally across most of the cities, there has been an increase. Um, def I, we would love some feedback on the drug um, overdose death brief, and you'll see there the trend over time is really shot up a lot. Um, so um, hopefully Narcan is making some impact, but it's definitely not overcome, be, has, has definitely not been able to overcome the um, sharp rise in drug overdose deaths across most of the cities. Right. Um, our next question comes from Maureen Benjamins, who asks, uh, how did the data that this platform provides differ from what's offered on City Health's dashboard? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. Uh, when we were, so one, one, I'm not sure if City Health dashboard actually has been able to um, update their data as well as much as we have. Um, the City Health dashboard has um, some great um, data that's actually, I think, in the subsidy level as well. Uh, we have many, many more indicators than they have. Uh, we have more race stratification, more trend data over time, um, and also some differences in visualization. So we have a smaller N, we have a smaller number of cities, but with many more indicators for those particular cities. And I think some of their data are also based on modeled small area estimates. And we that is not a methodology that we use. Um, we only use data that for which we have, you know, the information, not not the the modeled estimates. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from the QA from to hear to hear for read, who asks, uh, what is the best what are the best methods and practices nowadays for harvesting new data, specifically in highly dense cities? Um, our platform is a good place. <laughs> um, so, yeah, feel free to, I mean, um, yeah, get, get ideas from our platform as to what data are available. Um, again, we were mostly pulling, trying to pull from government sources. So those sources uh, may also be available in the, in other cities if you're looking to expand the city list um, that, and the data are not listed in our platform. I mean, I think the other, you know, the other thing I'd add um, is that a number of um, cities and other local jurisdictions have real-time access to emergency department data, hospital intake, this, you know, those types of indicators um, or data rather that um, they can use locally. One of the things we are thinking about and talking about, you know, with the team here, and also um, we have a data advisory group where we ask some questions, um, you know, as we think about next steps, is, is there a way to share, to get that data again, in a manner that's comparable across at least a critical mass of our member cities, you know, so some some portion of the 35 to make it, you know, worth the work to put it up on the platform, but, but that is where we need to go. It's more timely. I don't want to say it's more accurate, but I don't know with not a, not a data expert, not an epi, but it there's something real about it. And like I said, timely um, that we'd like to be able to tap into. And that's certainly something um, that we're talking about. But the the one thing I, the other thing I would say is that 
many of our member jurisdictions have more sophisticated data and have more sophisticated data that are publicly available. And again, the idea behind this platform is really to be able to get to what we can compare across member cities to then you know, share sort of a picture of what um, health in those jurisdictions look like, looks like. Great, thank you. Um, we've had another question come up in the Q&A um, from Jill Samuels, who asks, uh, is the data for blood lead levels up to date for 2020? Um, no, we hadn't, um, so is that Jill Samuels? Um, no, we would love, actually, if you're, um, if that's an area that you have some um, interest and expertise, we'd love to communicate with you offline. Um, we have had some trouble um, updating some of those data because of changes in the way the um, CDC has been defining um, lead poisoning and um, some of their, their, their websites and, and um, platforms have not been updated. So, um, but please reach out to us on email. We'd love to further the conversation with you if that's an area that you're particularly interested in. Thank you. I think that is um, all of the questions in the Q&A and the chat. Great. Well, thanks um, to our panelists and again, the team at, at Drexel who, um, an amazing partner in doing this work with us and to CDC and our other partners for supporting this work and to all of you for joining us. Um, please do feel free to reach out with questions about um, data that are on the platform, ideas about, you know, what would be useful moving forward, other data sources, you know, as I've said now a couple of times, this this originally was um, created from folks in the field to be able to think about what they needed to do their work. And, um, you know, we definitely want to continue that tradition. Um, there are a couple questions now in the chat about recording. Yes, um, we will make the recording available on our website, I think. Elizabeth will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and, you know, we can also, I believe, send that out to folks who signed up for the webinar who were here and through other um, communications mechanisms. So sign up for um, updates from the platform directly, sign up for our newsletter, follow us on Twitter, fill out the survey. I think I've now pushed several things you should do, but we really do want to keep in touch about this work. So thank you all. Um, and have a great afternoon.